UFO sightings are on the rise. So the question is, are aliens real? Or as many Christians report, just demons in disguise? Here's another question. Is there life on other planets? Well, the internet is full of really bad information. So if you've ever wanted to directly sit down and ask a renowned trusted scientist, I want you to watch this entire video because we're gonna answer those questions and many more. So help me welcome astrophysicist and author, Hugh Ross. He is the senior scholar and founder of Reasons to Believe, an organization that researches and communicates how discoveries about nature harmonize with the Holy Bible. Let's jump right in. All right, Dr. Hugh Ross, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm gonna jump right into the first question. Now, selfishly, I'm asking you questions that I am desperate to hear your answer on because I respect you so much, not just intellectually, but also spiritually, which is so unique about your life. But recently, the Wall Street Journal reported that, you know, according to U.S. intelligence reports, UFO sightings have increased in the past two years. So from a scientific perspective, from a spiritual perspective, is there any validity to these reports? I know so many people are asking the question, is there life outside of the planet? Well, two years ago is when the U.S. government and several European governments basically released a lot of classified uh, material on the uh, UFOs. And, you know, that sparked a lot of interest in UFOs. So I'm not at all surprised that they're getting more reports because it's on people's radar screen. And I'm not seeing anything in the new reports that's distinctly different from what's been happening over the past hundred years. But yes, it is true that they are getting more reports, mainly because people are, are reporting it. I mean, a lot of people I talk to I've had UFO encounters and they've never talked to anybody about it. Yeah, that's such a great point. And so what what do you make of these reports? How do you explain it from a scientific perspective? Because, you know, there's so much bad information online. What would you say? What What is this UFO phenomenon? Well, I was an amateur astronomer before I became a professional astronomer. And as an amateur, I always wound up with a job of dealing with the UFO reports that would come into our astronomy club or the universities uh, where I was studying. Uh, so without any intent on my part, I wound up becoming an expert on UFOs. And I can tell you that about 99% of what people report to me as UFOs are phenomena that are naturally explained. Uh, they're hoaxes uh, or it's secret military activity that's going on. When I look at the 1% residual, it has the property of defying the laws of physics. And yet in many cases, we can prove that the phenomena is real. We're dealing with non-physical reality. And you know, I took a course from Carl Sagan when I was at the University of Toronto. He was extremely dismissive of UFOs, but that was because his worldview would not tolerate the possibility of non-physical reality. As a Christian, my worldview does tolerate that possibility. I mean, God created another realm independent of the universe for the angels. And so what we see in this 1% residual, for example, is UFOs coming through our atmosphere at five to 18,000 miles per hour, but the witnesses never report a sonic boom. They never report any evidence of heat friction uh, behind the UFO. If this was a physical craft coming through our atmosphere, you would get easily uh, heard sonic booms. So for example, when this space shuttle come, came, comes through our atmosphere, you get two loud sonic booms and you see this trail of heat friction. We don't see that with the UFOs, but there's 2000 documented cases where observers see the UFO going through the atmosphere and it crashes into the earth. And when you go to the crash site, you actually see a shallow crater. If there's snow, the snow is melted. The vegetation is damaged. But when you investigate the crater site, you can't find any artifacts or debris. Again, if it's a physical craft, there would be debris. There would be some physical uh, artifacts that people could pick up. We don't see that. And then what's coming over these new reports uh, from the Navy and the Air Force 
is these pilots actually seeing these UFOs turning sharp right angle corners uh, or acute angles at five to 25,000 miles per hour. No physical object can withstand those G-forces. It would shatter. So we're dealing with non-physical reality. Wow. That's absolutely mind-blowing. And I want to focus on that phrase, non-physical reality. Now, having said that, do you see any kind of connection between occult activity and UFO sightings? Because if we can eliminate the variable of this is physical, we know it's not physical, it's not possible, and when you clearly establish that, then the next step is what connection between occult activity, supernatural, spiritual activity, maybe clandestine dark activity, and UFO sightings have you seen? Well, I'm the one Christian as an astrophysicist has written on this phenomena, but I know of five others who've spent at least a decade studying the UFO phenomena who are not believers. They agree with me that we're dealing with something beyond the space-time dimensions of the universe. The French astrophysicist Jacques Vallée, who's put the most research into the UFO phenomena, says we're dealing with interdimensional beings. Now, from a Christian perspective, we would recognize that angels are interdimensional beings. And this is where I think the research on close encounters is important. It was uh, Alan Hynek, the American astrophysicist, who came up with this term, close encounters of a first kind, second kind, third kind. Well, a close encounter is where the human contactee is less than 500 feet from the UFO phenomena. Uh, and then, you know, the second kind is where they actually have communication. Uh, third kind is where uh, there's actual contact. And... Uh, what we notice in these close encounters, in no case is it beneficial for the human contactee. It's always deleterious. Hmm. The best you're going to come away with from a close encounter is recurring terrifying nightmares. Hmm. What's the worst case scenario? People have been killed by these encounters. So injuries and death has happened. Uh, more commonly, it's the death or the injury of the animals. Uh, that are associated with the human contactee. And so we're not dealing with something that's uh, beneficial. We're dealing with something that's uh, harmful. And then when you look at those cases where a communication has come from these UFO beings to the human contactee, uh, number one, uh, their astronomy is never accurate. Right. Uh, it impresses the human contactee who's not educated in astronomy but it's always inaccurate. And moreover, the phenomena always keeps pace with our advancing technology. Mm. It's signs of deception. And that where there is actual verbal communication taking place, you know, a famous incident is where the human contactee was put into a trance and then began to write a book. It's called the Arantia book. And uh, it's the Bible of several UFO cult religions. Uh, it's almost 4,000 pages long. And a third of the content of the Arantia book is focused on denying the deity of Jesus Christ. Wow. You're a pastor. You should be able to figure out, okay, if that's what's going on, uh, we're dealing with the fallen angels. Because uh, this fits what the Bible tells us about the motivation uh, of the of the fallen angels, the demons. Wow, I, th that is just so such an incredible insight, and it makes total sense because as you take even a logical scientific journey now, you can see okay, we have to rule out a physical phenomenon, but that doesn't mean it's not any less real. It's just operating in another dimension, and we're, right. we're interacting with it. Then you look at the consequences, and then you take all the studies that coupled with that, and you see a very clear. And I, I hate to use this phrase, but I think it's apropos, like anti-Christ. And, and so even in that, so wow. Well, okay, well, let's go a little bit deeper because this is just so, so good. As an astrophysicist, uh, you know, just to extend out on this conversation, do you believe that it is possible for life to exist on another planet? 
So we've kind of dealt with the UFO aspect, but okay, we have this vast universe and there's got to be something, before right, Pastor Mike? <laughs> before I go there, Mike, uh, a couple of my colleagues and I wrote this book, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men. It's all about the UFO phenomena, but what's unique about the book, it's a scientifically testable hypothesis, testable in this way. We tell people, read the book. If you're having these UFO encounters, here's a list of occult activities that invite the demons, the fallen angels, to invade your life. If you get rid of all that, there'll be no more UFO encounters. Wow. But if you begin to practice these things, don't be surprised if you have these encounters. And the other point, point we put in the book is that UFO encounters vary across the globe, much higher in France and equatorial Brazil than it is in the United States. Why? Because there's many more people in France and equatorial Brazil uh, that are involved in the occult. There's a direct correlation between the percentage of the population involved in the occult and the percentage of the population that's having these UFO encounters. Wow. And the statistics even applies to the United States. You know, Hawaii and Alaska have a higher incidence of UFO reports than what you see, say, in Montana and Idaho. But there's a direct correlation between the percentage of the population that's involved in the occult uh, in those uh, regions. So. There is a scientifically testable explanation uh, for the UFO phenomena. I'm telling people, if you don't believe our explanation, put it to the test. Come on. You know, I, I would encourage everybody watching to grab the book. The link is in the description. So you just tap on the link and get the book. It is going to open up so much understanding and revelation and insight into what could be happening in your life. Uh, Dr. Ross, I, I'm, I'm sure you've seen some of the clips, but I go all over the world preaching the gospel, and I can't tell you how many people I've cast demons out of, which Christ commanded his believers to do. There's a lot of need for freedom. And so to see the convergence between the supernatural and the scientific is just truly unique to your ministry. And I'm encouraging everybody, tap the link in the description and get his book now. It's going to help you so much. So having said that, though, I mean, I hear this all the time uh, from from people that I pastor, you know, Pastor Mike, there's got to be life in the universe. There, there has to be something. And so, yes, maybe there's fallen angels and there's that spiritual aspect. But you're telling me that nowhere in the universe is, is there any kind of intelligent life. What would you say to that? Well, I've written six books answering your question. And basically making the point that uh, we astrophysicists have established what we call habitability requirements. And so, for example, for a planet to be habitable, it has to have a particular orbit around its host star. Its host star has to have particular characteristics. And so far, astronomers have discovered 14 planetary habitable zones. We've also discovered almost 5,000... 400 planets uh, beyond our solar system. Uh, but as we look at those planets, none of them reside in even three of the 14 known planetary habitable zones. For a planet to be truly habitable, it must simultaneously reside in all 14. And we only know of one planet that resides in all 14. It's the one that you're sitting on. <laughs> and so, Everywhere we look, we see conditions that are hostile, not only for advanced life, but even for microbial life. Now, we haven't searched the entire universe. On the other hand, as we look far away, we're looking at uh, galaxies and stars as they were in the past. But as we study the physics of these stars and galaxies, we can predict what they're gonna look like in the future. And they're gonna take on characteristics that are not gonna be habitable uh, for uh, life. Uh, so now there could be some faraway location uh, where God supernaturally designed a planet just like he did Earth. Uh, and there's nothing in the Bible that would forbid the possibility of God creating life elsewhere. Life, life, uh, well, there is one constraint. It's in Hebrews 9 and 10. Mm. Jesus Christ died one time, one place for all sinners. 
However, that would not rule out God creating grass on another planet or fish on another planet. It would simply rule out the possibility of him creating beings like us that are spiritual and in need of being redeemed uh, from their sin and uh, their evil. Uh, now, having said all that, I've been on public record since the 1980s. We will find the remains of life on the moon and Mars and several other solar system bodies. For the simple reason, God has packed our planet with such a huge abundance and diversity of life. And every time a big meteorite strikes the Earth, Earth's soil gets exported throughout the solar system. Mm. One ton of Earth's soil contains a hundred quadrillion, uh, no, part, yeah, yeah, 100 quadrillion microbes. And so I've written an article, you'll see it on our website, basically saying we need to go back to the moon because on the surface of the moon is 20,000 kilograms of Earth's soil for every 100 square kilometers. And in that Earth's soil, we will see the microbes of Earth's first light. Mm. And what's fascinating is that Earth's geology has destroyed the fossils of Earth's first light, mm. but has almost no geological activity. We can go to the moon, find the fossils of Earth's first light, and see who got the origin of life model correct, the atheists or the theists. And I actually got to speak at NASA Houston on this very topic and said, you need to go back to the moon. And everybody's going to be excited about this because the last time I checked, the U.S. taxpayer base was made up 100% of atheists and theists. <laughs> so everybody should be excited. And NASA could actually have the privilege of proving who got the origin of life model right. I love it. I absolutely love that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just so good. You have an incredible ability to put very complex things in terms that people can understand. And this has just been such a rich conversation. Um, you know, I just have a few more questions. You've been so generous with your time. Uh, many of you watching right now have, have been regulars to my, you know, my videos. And, you know, I've reached millions of people every month. And, and I've played some part in, in your life as a Christian, but you may not know that in the early 2000s, I considered myself a full-blown atheist, and I ended up randomly, I'm saying it in air quotes, moving in with an Ivy League-educated theologian my junior year of college, and he just systematically destroyed every argument that I had against God. And it was in that season that I was introduced to uh, Dr. Hugh Ross. And so it's it's such an incredible honor to even be able to have this conversation because he was a catalyst for my journey back to Jesus Christ. And, and so I remember just reading your work and I remember watching lectures. And this is way back when, you know, it's almost 20 years now and um, just weeping. And, and it was because I didn't know that you could marry faith and reason. I, I thought that you had to kind of like divorce the scientific part of your mind from the emotional part of your soul. And it was really Dr. Hugh Ross helped me bring all those worlds into full surrender to Jesus Christ, my entire being. And so if you have just a few, just a few short moments to share your journey, because I believe you went from agnostic to Christian and, and there was some scientific evidence that you found in Scripture that actually convinced you uh, as part of your journey. I don't, I don't know if you have just a few moments to share that. Well, I was born and raised and educated in Canada, uh, but I got interested in astronomy when I was just seven years of age. In fact, from the age of seven onwards, I was reading four or five books on astronomy and physics a week. And by the time I was 16, I realized the universe has a beginning. And if the universe has a beginning, there must be a cosmic beginner. And I wanted to find that cosmic beginner. I didn't really know where to look because I wasn't raised in a Christian home. And so I began to study the great philosophers, Immanuel Kant. He's considered to be the father of a cosmology. So I read his critique of pure reason and said, you know, this really isn't fitting what, what I understand about the universe. I read René Descartes and I went to a high school where we had people, refugees from all around the world. And so my fellow uh, students were encouraging me, well, look at the uh, Hindu Vedas. 
uh, look at the Buddhist commentaries, look at the Quran. So I began to study the world's holy books and recognize that what they were saying about the universe was provably incorrect. Uh, but I did get to have significant contact with two Christians when I was 11 years of age. And these were two businessmen that came into our public school. They didn't say a single word, but they put two boxes on our teacher's desk, and those boxes were filled with Gideon Bibles. So I began to read that Gideon Bible at age 17, and right away recognized that the opening pages of the Bible describe an account of creation. And what amazed me is how perfectly it followed the scientific method. Years later, I discovered why the scientific method comes from the pages of scripture. But saw that scientific method, went through the account of the six creation days and realized everything is correctly described and the correct chronological order. The Bible got this right. I began to continue reading into the Bible, realized I got all the astronomy right. I spent 18 months, one or two hours a night, studying the Bible. And when I finally got to Revelation 22, I realized I'd not been able to find a single provable error or contradiction. And I found over 200 places where the Bible accurately predicted future scientific discoveries. And I still remember the night, it was like one in the morning, I went through a calculation. What's the probability that these Bible authors could have predicted all these scientific discoveries accurately without the God of the universe inspiring them to write what they wrote? And that probability was less than one chance in 10 to the 300 power. <laughs> and I was weak. My physics professor gave us an assignment to calculate the probability that one of us in the class would be killed by a sudden reversal of the second law of thermodynamics. That probability is one chance in 10 to the 80th, which is so small, no one needs to worry about ever being killed by a reversal of the second law of thermodynamics. But I had just proved to myself that the message of the Bible was 10 to the 220 times more reliable than the second law of thermodynamics. And I gotta give credit to the Gideons because the Gideon Bible it gave me had two pages at the back explaining what you need to do once you become convinced you're reading the inspired inerrant word from the one that created the universe. Explain to me uh, that I needed to live up to the Bible's uh, moral standard. And I was very attracted by that moral standard, hmm. but realized I couldn't live up to it. And the Gideons explain that the creator of the universe, Jesus Christ, came to planet Earth, lived a life of moral perfection in front of us as an example, but then made an offer to trade his moral perfection for a moral imperfection. And the Gideons don't let you off the hook. They got a place for you to sign your name and date it, committing your life to receive Jesus Christ as the savior from all of your sins and to make him the boss of your life because he knows better than you do what's best for you. So uh, I made that commitment at 107 in the morning uh, in my uh, sophomore physics uh, uh, university year and um, right away began to look for opportunities to share my faith mm -hmm. and God the amazing opportunities literally within weeks after I signed my name in the back of the Gideon Bible. Oh, wow. I, you know, the presence of the Holy Spirit has just been so, so, so palpable throughout this entire talk. You almost had me in tears. I know that there are many mothers that are watching who have children that have either abandoned the faith or maybe never came to Christ. And and so there's, there's a wrestling happening. God, when is something going to happen in my family? And your story gives so much hope that the answers are there. And it's just such an emotional moment. I've got one last question for you, and it just ties perfectly into, into the story that you told. And I'm asking you partly as a, a genius status scientist, uh, but also a humble servant of Jesus Christ. What happens when we die? Okay, uh, I've been asked that by several people that have been at death's door. And if they are a committed follower of Jesus Christ, I tell them, uh, if they're lucid at the time of death, you'll hear your name being called and you'll get a personal escort 
uh, from this realm into the next realm. It's Psalm 23, uh, where, you know, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. And, uh, you know, God will take you across that threshold. And uh, I'm friends uh, with another pastor in our church. I'm on a pastoral staff of a church. And uh, one of those has been with 300 people, Christians, uh, who are lucid at the time they die. And he says, in every single case, they say, I have to say goodbye. He's telling me it's time. And then they go. They hear their name. And they cross that threshold. And they go from the realm of the universe with its space-time dimensions into a completely different dimensional realm to be with Jesus Christ and to be with all uh, the dead in Christ that have preceded them. And uh, in every case, they'll be welcomed by all these people, uh, congratulating them on their life. Now, the same pastor told me he's also had experiences with people uh, that were denying uh, God and wanted nothing to do with God. And he says, and they're loose at the time of death. They're screaming obscenities at God and rejoicing that they get to go to hell. I mean, I tell people that God gives you a choice of where to spend eternity. You can spend eternity with him or eternity without him. If you want nothing to do with God, he's got a place for you. But if you want to spend eternity with God, he's got a place for you. But in both cases, the place has got nothing to do with his universe. You know, when the universe fulfills its purpose that God has intended for, he'll replace his universe with a brand new realm. And so as he spoke the universe into existence, he'll speak it out of existence. Mm. And the Bible tells us when that happens, both heaven and hell survive, which means they're not part of the dimensional realm of our universe. They're beyond. So profound, so absolutely profound. Dr. Hugh Ross, this has been one of my favorite conversations of my life. I feel like it was two decades uh, waiting. I tried desperately not to cut you off because there was just so much wisdom in everything that you said. I cannot thank you enough on behalf of the entire channel. Everybody jump into the comment section right now. Let me know your favorite moment. Uh, I know that you have reasons.org. You have so many books. Where can people find out more? I'd love to send people, uh, but where do you think is the best place to, to find your resources? Well, reasons.org, they'll find tens of thousands of articles and thousands of video clips. Uh, but you mentioned my books earlier. People can get three chapters of my books by simply going to reasons.org slash Ross. Thank you so much. I am so excited to see all the testimonies as a result of our conversation today. And I, I'm just so appreciative of your life. Well, thank you.